in Switzerland, in Geneva. here indeed i came to switzerland for three weeks expecting to explore it from head to toe if i may say so and anyway why not i started on the plane from montenegro to milan where i took an overnight bus to geneva one of the switzerland's most vibrant cities in spite of all the luxury that is coming from all quarters, Geneva is not the richest and, consequently, not the most expensive Swiss canton, which, to put it mildly, will shake me to the foundations in the future. <coughs> but first things first. The first thing that catches your eye when you come to the waterfront is the promenade itself. Just kidding. The city is nestled on the shores of Lake Geneva, and the surrounding mountains offer incredible views. And the flags. A lot of huge flags. For example, the most famous, in as much as it's the only one here, bridge across the lake is lined with flags, which made me feel unbelievably happy. This is where I first launched B-Boy, and I'd probably never seen such cinematic views in my life. My eye was instantly caught by the yellow boats cruising along the shore with practically no passengers. My hostel, the most expensive damn hostel in my life, at 50 francs a night, gave me a transport card for free travel throughout Geneva, and I couldn't resist jumping into the first boat and sailing ahead without arranging the route. Viewing the city from the boat was definitely a kind of pleasure, so I skipped the terminal station several times to sail another circle. In general, I probably tired out the steersman quite a bit. Well, so it goes. <laughs> That's his job. The only thing that gave me no peace was unsophisticated. Where was Geneva's calling card? The huge fountain towering tens of meters. I could hardly have failed to notice the 200 meter stream of water gushing directly from the lake. And after watching the shots from B-Boy, it came crystal clear that something seemed off. The fountain appeared to be turned on after 10 am. Do they really know the word cast effectiveness in Geneva? So I had enough time to walk around, periodically dropping my jaw from the concentration of richness per square meter of Geneva. 
The main street is dotted with the most expensive stores packed with brands I am not even, luckily, aware of. Here you can see some kind of musicians or artists. It is noteworthy that the locals do not look like they're wearing shorts and pants for hundreds and hundreds of francs. The Swiss mostly prefer stylish but understated clothing. So, the main street filled with stores like Gucci, Prada and Louis Vuitton is mostly frequented by tourists. It seems that the locals go for accuracy in all things. Apart from the modest appearance, I was struck by how athletic the Swiss were. In the late morning, the waterfront is literally flooded with runners. They run a lot. In the morning before work, at lunchtime and in the evening. Young and old people, dog owners and even moms with baby carriages. Healthy lifestyles seem to be quite trendy here. Well, I, as a pseudo-rich tourist, very much wanted to buy something here. So it was time to change money. Which, however, was not necessary. Euros are in use almost all over the country, not to mention the cards. But I was just interested in Swiss francs, for good reason. For sure, the franc is the most stable currency in the world, and the design of it was made by a real professional. The vertical banknotes with a transparent Swiss cross in the corner is a very unusual styling. I'm holding banknotes printed since 2016, and almost all of them have won the title of the most beautiful banknotes in the world in different years. Everything is about Switzerland. The mechanism of the Swiss watch next to the railroad that carries the most punctual and expensive trains in the world. Incredible nature. A paraglider flying among the majestic Swiss Alps. But I still wonder whose hands are depicted on the banknote's face. And such a souvenir now adorns my fridge. According to this famous Geneva clock, it was time to go shopping in the old town, where the store I wanted was located. One hour later. Indeed. I'm a travel blogger now. A genuine one, honestly. And my videos will finally feature me. Imagine that. The key tourist attraction in the old town is the Geneva Cathedral, an early closing one, so that I managed to get it only on the second day. Beautiful stained glass windows and rather unusual ceilings. That's all I have to say about it. Its exterior is pretty good, but in my opinion it lacks the very Swiss identity when it comes to churches and cathedrals. However, I saw plenty of that later on. So, as they say, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, YouTube, for YouTube. Yeah, what's the theme? I have a travel channel. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Awesome. Enjoy your time. Thank you so much. Even though Geneva's old town is extremely small, it's very sleepy, peaceful and generally not crowded in the evening, which is after 5 pm. Old clock towers, moss-covered tiles, lots of authentic staircases and my favorite lanterns. Geneva's cathedral locates on a hill, 
so you can quietly and calmly observe the happenings on the main store street at the foot. In fact, Geneva is a small city. In my understanding, Switzerland in general doesn't have large cities. Here, for example, about 200,000 people live, and they live without ruffle or excitement. In general, the country feels like a calm, unhurried, secure and safe heaven, surrounded by snow-caped mountains, evergreen meadows and never-frozen lakes. It's incredibly peaceful. A 15-minute walk from the downtown will result in a natural oasis with blooming trees, parks and an open-air botanical garden, where locals have picnics, walk with children, sit or lie on benches and read books and newspapers. And a view of the clearest lake, full of swans, ducks and other birds, is all along the way. Far and near are the swans. They make nests, chase each other, are absolutely not afraid of people or noisy roaring boats, and are generally a great living decoration for any place. Some people even arm themselves with these monster photo cannons to make pictures of them. I asked the owner for this thing to take a picture. This mini telescope looks great. Wow. And what about the fountain? After all, this is the most recognizable site of Geneva. And for a reason. At the least, it's unusual. At the most, it's a fascinating one. I admired the fountain all three days of my stay. It looks great in any weather, whether it meet a cloudless blue sky or dark thunderstorm clouds. Its height is 140 meters, and we can only guess how much it costs to push upward 500 liters of water per second, every single day from dawn to dusk. The cool thing is that you can even walk right up to it when the wind is blowing in the opposite direction from the ramp. But only if you are not scared of being soaked to the skin under those flying sprays. As for me, I felt little uneasy, since in early April the temperature rarely rose above 5-6 degrees Celsius during the day. Geneva is one of the four places where the UN is headquartered. The building is surrounded by hundreds of flags and the fence with a modest inscription, by which, for some reason, tourists endlessly take pictures. For me, the sculpture across the street, namely the giant broken chair, is a much funnier sight to take a couple of stupid photos. However, the message of such a comical object is rather unhappy. 
the chair was put there in the hope of forcing the government to ban the use of anti-personnel mines. Actually, one leg of the chair is snapped off for a reason. Initially, the sculpture was supposed to stand on the square for three months, and now it's been here for 15 years. From there, I headed straight to one of the funnest neighborhoods in Geneva, where smooth houses were located. And I'm not even kidding right now. It's a complex of super fun, colorful buildings that really make your head spin. A mixture of all sorts of colors. Cylindrical turrets, semicircular lodges, and triangular balconies. All houses are worlds apart, but the sense of total architectural madness units them perfectly. Of course, it would be very interesting to take a look inside, but unfortunately, nobody invited me. You shouldn't come here drunk, otherwise you will definitely experience something special. The Duke of Brunswick's mausoleum is another interesting, though far more momentous, structure. It's located on the first line opposite the fountain. And the most curious thing is, in fact, its construction. Briefly. The Duke was a native of Paris, where he allegedly made a large, I don't know how large, but apparently huge fortune. Deciding that Geneva attracted him by far more than Paris, which was not surprising at all, the Duke moved here, and before his death, he promised to bestow all his estate on the city, on the condition that he would be buried with, I quote, unprecedented honors, and a monument in addition. And so, the first and only mausoleum in Geneva was built from where the Duke still observes the grandest fountain against a background of a beautiful lake and mountains. Oddly enough, nowadays many people follow the Duke's example, preferring to live or at least to work in Geneva rather than in bordering France, where prices, of course, are twice as low, but wages are not a patch on Swiss ones. Let's talk about money again. In a nutshell, everything is very, very expensive. Food, transportation, housing, and even Chinese souvenirs cost some crazy money. I went to the most common chain supermarket, and that's what I saw. Chicken breast 25 francs a kilo, cheese at least 30, eggs? I'd rather not say. They probably sell them in sets of 4, 6 or 10 because of the prices. In this context, the factory Swiss chocolates at 220 for a 100 gram bar are a gift. Although some products either for beggars or for tourists stunned by what's going on under the brand Budget, are almost cheaper than in Russia. I've bought a few of these chocolates, and comparing them with the ordinary, I mean the expensive ones, I suggest they're quite appetizing, especially for this money in this country. Free breakfasts in the hostels and even in Buffett format was just a salvation in this situation. 
the last thing I want to tell you before we move on is some a few details about the structure of the country. First of all, it's interesting because of the abundance of different flags in all the towns and villages I visited. No matter how funny it sounds, the fact is that Switzerland is a federal republic. In plain language, it consists of 26 independent cantons, each of which has its own legislation, government and courts. At the same time, each canton consists of communities, which also may make their own decisions. Due to the fact that Switzerland has an unimaginable number of different languages, religions and cultures mixed up in a seemingly tiny country, the country maintains nationhood, while not interfering in certain groups living a bit their own way. For example, let's focus on such a hot topic as taxes. While some cantons have paradisical conditions, for example, the richest canton is Tiny Zag, which attracts entrepreneurs of all kinds due to its low tax rates. Other ones, like Geneva, are called tax hell, with their progressive taxation. The local license plates really caught my attention. Not only are they quite strange in general, look at those tiny plates at the front. The rare plate, instead of the usual blue European style, has the Swiss coat of arms on the left and the coat of arms of the registering canton on the right. To cut a long story short, I thought it would be really fun to put together a collection of license plates from all the cantons. And this is what came out of it. One plate I searched for through the parking lots for three weeks straight with no luck at all. But since I managed to shoot it anyway, I consider my challenge accomplished. After a train ride along the lake with gorgeous panoramas outside, I arrived in Lausanne the capital of the French-speaking canton called Vaux. The French spell it like this, and the license plate reads like this. Yeah. And the city greeted me with the rain. Nevertheless, I enjoyed walking along the waterfront, watching the flowering willows swaying in the breeze, admiring the water of Lake Geneva, normally smooth as glass. I learned there that Avian is not just a water brand, but an entire resort in France, which can be reached by ferry from Lausanne. The weather in Switzerland is generally quite changeable. So, a few hours later, the sun came out, revealing the incredible beauty of the mountains. And how much time is it? Time to see what's been built on the waterfront.
example, is a castle with a funny name Dushi. In Russian it means ears. It was built in the 12th century, passed through several reconstructions, was a residence for bishops and a prison, but after a major fire was abandoned for many years, until finally it was bought and renovated into a hotel. Perhaps not the most honorable background, but now it is at least a good decoration of the waterfront along with those beautiful flowering trees. I don't know what they are called, but I like them. After walking and flying along the waterfront, it was time to go to the old central neighborhoods, and I used one of the smallest subways in the world. My station was called Olympic, and the ceiling was designed appropriately. The funny thing is that Lausanne has the title of the Olympic capital of the world, despite the fact that it has never hosted the Olympic Games. There are Olympic symbols far or near, from the main train station to the police cars. Then. After waiting and being inside a super modern fully automatic self-driving train, seven minutes later I was in the heart of the city, at a decent height above the sea level with gorgeous views. I immediately fell in love with Lausanne after a short walk through these ancient streets and look at the city panorama from above. The city doesn't dazzle with its luster and wealth like Geneva, but its ancient walls and curved roofs are awash with nobility, and you can feel it in the air. Just look at the subway exit. In terms of architecture, you can feel the air of Paris in some places. I mean it, don't tell I'm lying. The main cathedral of Lausanne, where I'm going, is at the very top of a hill amid old neighborhoods. To get there, you need to cross a bridge, and I stayed there for a good half hour. It offers very cool views. All the little houses, the old roofs and attics, the smoke from the chimneys, the occasional tiny people and little cars on the horizon. Not to mention the view of the cathedral itself. And the idol was disturbed by a sign of McDonald's, where I certainly wanted to go afterwards. And now, the beautiful square with the incredible smell of blooming trees pictured by tourists in a non-stop mode. Well, one tourist in a Finnish scar's hat takes a video of herself, which provokes the surprised looks of the Swiss, who think that someone just left his camera on a tripod here. And that someone is waving to the Swiss right now, so they don't worry about this beautiful, lonely cannon. After giggling at the Mudets Museum of Contemporary Art, I finally made it to the main viewpoint in Lausanne. And it didn't disappoint me. It was beautiful.
the cathedral wasn't scaffolded. And the stupid birds didn't make it, my b-boy. Interfering with this shooting. But travels now? No if. Nevertheless, I really enjoyed it. It was time to go down. No, not so much down. But just down to the old center to get to the church that had been making beautiful but super loud bell sounds for half an hour on the occasion of the approaching Catholic Easter. After kindly waiting for the door itself to swing open to me and going inside, I found out that nothing unusual was inside. The most interesting thing was the big organ. But, you know, we've seen bigger organs. Please don't judge this joke. There are more amusing posters here, just so you know. Anyway, walking through the city center among such stores as a Rolex, look at the unusual figures above each sign. I finally decided to visit a luxury restaurant in the heart of Lausanne. Not forgetting to drink some water from the fountain like the pigeons did. There it was. My favorite McDonald's. The one that took away from the scenery of the old town. Cheeseburger. За 2.90. It's official that McFlurry with Toblerone are a mess because of the allegedly bitter chocolate syrup. After enjoying a masterpiece of old Swiss cuisine, I went back to the waterfront, intending to make my first tripod assistant time-lapse shooting. And suddenly it came on to rain, as evidenced by my poor operational camera. But as soon as the rain stopped, the evening was completely transformed. It is Lausanne that offers one of the most gorgeous views of the Swiss Alps. What a beauty! And this is what I ended up with. On that happy note, I bid farewell to the French cantons and moved to the German part of the country, and namely... I am in Bern, my first German canton, and the difference with the French part, of course, is absolutely colossal, but the French part of me liked me more, not in the last part, because of the language, because I speak in French, but I don't say in German. The center of the city is very controlled, Прям по-немецки все. Одинаковые, серые, стандартные здания. Никакого ни флажка не висит, никакой финтифлюшки, ничего такого. Во французской части флаги, везде флаги, вот так вот, везде флаги. Здесь нет. In fact, my first emotion in the face of such stark contrast was boredom. This is the main street of which I'm talking about, and the only entertainment here is to run away before the approaching streetcars. Because either the tramways are laid on the footpath or the whole road was turned into one solid footpath by people, there are no designations or markings. A strange thing for the most scrupulous burn. Nothing to catch the eye besides the two clock towers, one of which is really eye-catching, with its design and features. All of those spying upon the buses and streetcars going through the arches is fun, and even I would say cinematic. 
<clears throat> After watching the footage, I realized that the main feature of the tower, namely the astronomical dial and the bay window with the clown beating the bell and the dancing bears, has not been captured on the video for some reason. I didn't know the reason, but here are some of my pictures. And actually, the sound of this hourly action. In short, the operator, me, should get a rap over the knuckles. It is worth noting that my cheapest hostel in the city was 10 meters away from this tower. And when I went to the bathroom, I could hear through the wall every streetcar passing by, not to mention the endless bell ringing. Anyway, the old town fortunately is more than one street. And I set forward. At first, along the same grey houses, and then down and down and down to the river. Suddenly, I realized that the town was truly two-tiered, and the first tier has some very charismatic old houses. It's worth a look. I liked that entourage a lot better. While the proverbial restraint is noticeable here as well, it lacks such complete uniformity. Houses with colored shutters, painted in modest, pastel, but still different colors. Authentic, distinctive aged roofs, random chimneys, attractively designed arches, green hills, and finally, houses with lintels. All of that and the total absence of tourists makes for a very pleasant atmosphere. Not to mention the view of the river, with a park on the other bank, with several trails. On the hilltops and right along the river, where you can stroll alone to the sound of running water and singing birds. Once here, I could not believe that I was still in the center of one of the busiest, most touristic and large Swiss towns. It's very, very peaceful. Just look at this bridge being crossed by lazy streetcars and leisure people watching this panorama. In any case, the views of the old city and the burnt cathedral, the next point of my chaotic route, left no doubts as to where I was. After crossing the river, I made my way to the central square at the foot of this enormous 100-meter cathedral. It looks quite large from below, and the tangled roads running to the point of ascent are simply beautiful. Most of them. As you can see, the German Swiss are vandals to an extent and have some sense of humor. I had two options. To walk up the old stairs or take the elevator to get to the top in a few seconds. Except that the second option posed a problem. I'm too greedy for such a stupid waste. The public spaces in Switzerland are top-notch indeed. They're splendid. Bern, as many other cities, has many places with tables and chairs for all comers. Look at the people, relaxing and admiring the bell tower of the cathedral. 
and next to it you can sit and enjoy such a cool view. The place is something between a square and a park, where pensioners pop metal balls, playing a strange French game incomprehensible to me. And the audience is entertained by a guy in the guise of some strolling musician. Somewhat awkward, but with the sense of aptitude. What about the cathedral? Shooting is forbidden inside, and going to the bell tower costs money, which sounded gracelessly when you have b-boy in your backpack. Construction began in the 13th century with a small church, which was later reconstructed until the 16th century. Then the cathedral was abandoned for three centuries, until they decided to add the famous spire. As a result, the construction took no less than 600 years. I wasn't born during Catholic Easter, so I happened to catch a ceremony in one of the churches with gathered quite a few locals. Christus For the first time in my life, I saw and listened to the organ music in the church, and then I hurriedly slipped out so as not to embarrass people with my camera. Walking along the river, I saw two bridges connecting the two banks on both tiers of the city. After standing for half an hour with my camera at hand to that effect, I suddenly stumbled upon a mini funicular, willing to take everyone up for free. The cobblestones are really cool here, with someone's name stamped on every brick. Very, very, very many names. After noticing that everyone around was eating ice cream, an incredibly tiny surf, by the way, I walked over to the stall and, once again stunned by the Swiss prices, I strolled onward. Beyond the river are very nice and, for sure, impossibly expensive residential neighborhoods. I repeat it again. The place provides ceiling-level tranquility. And even the streetcars passing on high bridges do not disturb, but reinforce the idol. The river is so clean, crystalline, and very cold so far. Кто-то купался. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't go. Просто сижу и отдыхаю после долгого съемочного дня. С таким видом и с таким звуковым сопровождением. Evening was coming on, and on my way to my hostel, I caught the sound of fountains. Fountains in front of the Federal Palace, where the Swiss government sat. In fact, that's why many people call Bern the capital, although officially Switzerland has no capital at all. But sitting there and watching the playful jets of water, I had some other bright ideas, which had woken a child in myself. And so I could not help but have a joy of running among the fountains trying to judge the spray, and of course soaked from head to foot. Meet Kate, 21 years old, who loves to do silly things at such an advanced age. Mm -hmm. 
after giving me one last gift of a beautiful sunset, the Swiss weather finally and irrevocably became worse. The next morning it started to rain. It rained and rained and rained. In Bern, in Lucerne, in Zag and in Zurich. So I had no choice but to take an umbrella, a rainproof phone and head straight into the damp rainy grayness. Anyway, there was one more place on my must-see list. Mount Gurten. It's more of a hill, given its height of 300 meters. The way to it was a very strange street with peculiar... um... sculptures. But my favorite was the bike with the stroller on top. And so, after waiting a bit for the carriage, we went up. The ascent takes about 5 minutes, with even a couple of stops on the route. Плохой вид на Берн открывается с этой горы, на которую я бесплатно заехала по проездному от отеля. А когда речь о Швейцарии, слово бесплатно не может не радовать. Walking around and looking at those endless green meadows with their neat path that seemed to disappear over the horizon, I wanted to go there. All alone. Just me and the great outdoors. So, despite the strong wind and the extremely unattractive sky, ready to rain at any moment, I walked forward. When I reached to the crossroads, where I could turn back to the funicular, for some reason I chose the other way. And it turned out to be a long, long descent, taking me farther and farther away from Bern. Milky, mo, mo, куда я иду? Вообще без понятия. Ну-ка признавайтесь, кто это сделал? Да. Finally, at the foot, without the slightest idea of what kind of town it was. I saw a train approaching and jumped on it in the hope that I could get off at the central burn train station. Luckily, at least this time, I made the right choice, because as soon as I got off, well, the only thing to do in this weather was to ride up and down on the mini funicular, and my free pass was valid for it as well. It's really cool how they pass one another on the single lane. 
The rest of the amusements in Bern were much the same, so I had nothing to do but to rest from the camera and shooting. And while my first impression of Bern was rather ambiguous, I can summarize it as follows. Но, конечно, очень красивый город, двухуровневый, река, вода, классный собор, есть на что посмотреть. Как-то так. In short, come to burn, and I will move on. Lucerne is a small town with a population of only 80,000 people, located on the shores of Vierwaldstätter See, or, more simply, Lake Lucerne. The city was a whiff of fresh air after the extra-conservative austerity of Bern. But that's not exactly how it started. In Lucerne, I was welcomed not by pleasant bright sunshine, but by... And unlike the grey stern burn, this weather is unbecoming for this city at all. Well, I had nothing to do but to shelter under the bridge carefully sticking my camera out from under the canopy, which didn't upset me at all, because the bridge with the hard-to-pronounce name Kappelbrücke was the city's calling card. It is considered the oldest covered bridge in Europe, but the 34-meter water tower skirted by this bridge was built even earlier, about 1300 years. Unfortunately, the bridge was very badly damaged by fire 30 years ago and was reconstructed. The fire destroyed two-thirds of the medieval triangular paintings on the valued roof. The surviving pieces can still be seen here if you look up from the middle of the bridge. And in the evening you can do it without the crowds of tourists. Apparently, Lucerne is an extremely popular tourist place by Swiss standards, because it's the only place where I found a shopping center entirely packed with souvenirs of all colors, sizes and prices. And while the weather outside was like this, I felt like lingering here for a good hour, wandering the floors filled with such useless, expensive, but fun stuff. Casa Grande is a chain of souvenir stores, which symbol is these Swiss charmers. Look, there are souvenir baskets, and some actually used them, although individual items can't even be put in a basket. Just check out this giant bell. It fits only an elephant? I hadn't seen so many different and super overpriced chocolates in a long time. But that's not what I came for. I came for a couple of new magnets to add to my collection. As for the chocolates, I got them at the ordinary supermarket across the street, paying exactly half as much. Now the Jewish music should be playing. Ну, могу себе позволить, так сказать. Вкус Швейцарии. 
Meanwhile, the rain took a break, and I could explore the downtown. The painting on the walls and even under the roofs deserve special attention. They look super authentic. There's quite a lot of it. It's quite different, and it's a beautiful decoration that fills up the plain old facades in some locations. The atmospheric places. The signs I love. Many different flags. The river. The flowers. All of these things gave me some particularly warm feelings about the city. So what happened here the next day? could truly be considered a miracle. Я в Люцерне, сегодня первый день солнца. Первый и единственный из четырех дней, что я проведу здесь. Oh yeah! Finally! What a Geneva vibe! The bridge, the lake, the mountains, the swans, the flags which I love, the fairies, and all this beauty surrounded by gorgeous, still snow-covered mountains. Amazing! After watching the ships, <laughs> the shipmasters, I decided to take a look at the city from above. But because of the three airports, B-Boy is forbidden from flying here. So, I went to conquer the local fortress, which included a fortress wall 870 meters long and nine towers, three of which were open to the public. On the way I saw a smaller version of the main wooden bridge with the even more difficult name Sproebrücke and a small river dam. The bridge is a little younger than Kappelbrücke, it was built in the 15th century, but has survived to this day and hasn't been damaged by fire. In general, it was a very picturesque place, which I still had to leave to continue on my way. And all of this for an absolutely unreal view of Lucerne. Indeed, the view is gorgeous here, though exploring the fortress is no less interesting. I visited all three towers, but the most interesting one was the clock tower. You literally get inside the clock, where you can peep at unsuspecting tourists at the foot of the wall. The windows here look out on all four corners. So the view is great. Some mechanisms are even moving, and even the bell is ringing. In short, the fortress has a life of its own. I decided to walk along the wall, admiring the city from above. And suddenly, I saw a local woman leaning out of a window in hopes to smoke a cigarette in peace. Nothing of the kind. This woman lived here in the downtown of Lucerne and rented a studio right under the fortress. Either for work or for art, I never understood. I asked all the locals I talked to if it was expensive for them to live in Switzerland. What did they think of the local prices? I was pretty shocked when I saw the prices. <laughs> and I can imagine. Now it's very, very expensive. 
and you know people generally uh, work a lot and uh, earn also more than in other countries. Oh well, yeah, that's why I asked you, is it expensive like for locals? It depends on your, on your revenue. Yeah. Well, okay. But I always uh, wondering how so many people can travel to Switzerland. <laughs> Indeed, it beats where all these tourists get so much dough. Nevertheless, according to her, the Covid had reduced the flow of tourists to almost zero. Maybe it's the time of year, mid-spring is not the peak season, but there really aren't too many tourists. And in many places it feels like they're unknown at all. When I came down from the other side of the fortress, I was hooked for a few minutes by these meadows with different animals. First, I like these... Swintose! Oh, еще Pigs! Probably not even realizing how much the land they were lying on was worth. The second thing that caught my attention was these cuties. I didn't even know who they were but their ears and heads made me smile time after time, and not just that. <laughs> Third, they were buffaloes, lying and chewing the grass, but I didn't get anything funny from them. I saw the next point of my extemporary journey a crystal house on the mountain. And the best part was that since the castle was a super luxury and expensive hotel, they built a funicular especially for it. Finally, I found a place where I wouldn't have to walk upstairs. In short, let's go. The ascent takes about two minutes. And my friends, the view, the clock tower, forgive me, is even more incredible. Just look, I've suddenly run out of words to describe all this beauty over and over again. Tiny cars on bridges, tiny pedestrians, trains passing underneath, striking towers, rooftops, ships, all amid majestic mountains. If you add the almost total absence of people, it's just a perfect location. So I was here for more than an hour, brazenly taking over one of the hotel chairs. And of course, I put the camera on time-lapse. The castle itself, by the way, looks quite nice. The room prices are not stratospheric, in terms of Switzerland, of course. <laughs> the hell you need this hotel? You want to check out that time-lapse, do you? I do, to be honest. It's always exhausting waiting for the time-lapse. After watching the mountains from above, I wanted to go down to the lake to get a little closer to them. That day was the only day when the peaks were not hidden by clouds. They even started renting catamarans in such good weather. Sitting on the quay, literally at the water's edge, watching the huge ferries and small catamarans scurrying from side to side is a separate kind of pleasure. Even the swans were interested in such outlandish things on their lake. But I couldn't linger here, for evening was coming on inexorably, and I still had one more unusual and super secluded place to visit. I haven't found any intelligible information about it, so you and I will become pathbreakers in a way. The way to it seems to be the Windows XP splash screen.
the road there is currently blocked because someone has bought out a piece of land that could be used to access this tiny beach with a gorgeous view of Mount Pilatus, one of the most famous peaks in the vicinity of Lucerne. But here I am nonetheless. And this is what I came here for. A small chapel, barely big enough to hold more than a couple of people, built on a tiny island some distance from the shore. As you can see, it has no direct access to land. Those who want to look inside will have to swim a few dozen meters. I don't want. It's April after all. The decision to go to the middle of nowhere for a lonely chapel might seem strange. But an evening in the company of screaming seagulls, rustling waves, and silent mountains will stay in my memory for a long time. An evening when I watched the setting sun which lit these beautiful landscapes and the small lonely chapel in the middle of the lake. On that happy note, we're off to the last city on my list. The biggest Swiss city, where money from all over the world flows. The city with the highest wages and fainting prices. The city where expensive cigar butts, smoked by obviously not too well-mannered billionaires, are lying on the perfect sidewalks. The city. But enough of the pompous introductions. I'm talking about Zurich. Unfortunately, I stayed here only for one day, and it was raining for a good half a week. I was sick of all of these rains. Nevertheless, I saw a lot of interesting things, and what was even more surprising, I managed to feel its unique, one-of-a-kind atmosphere. As soon as you enter the city at the central station, you immediately find yourself in a world of blue and white streetcars, just like the flag colors. In my opinion, the streetcars, as the main public transport, are kind of symbol of Zurich, which means that tramways are laid simply everywhere. In the old center, along the lake, and on bridges. They are really everywhere. The streetcars here are cool, old but functional. And the new ones look like some kind of streetcar supercars. One will fare will cost 270. I know this solely because of the most expensive, yet lamest hostel on my entire trip squeezed a free pass. Apart from the streetcars, the city may be explored on public boats, very movie-like, sailing under rather low bridges. Their decks are completely covered, which offers a good pastime in this weather. However, waiting for a boat on the pier was simply unbearable. There was not only the rain and wind, but a low temperature of barely plus 4 Celsius, which was a bit of disaster for my light windbreaker. It was all the more surprising to watch the locals straining at the oars in just their shorts. The Swiss are very athletic. Did I tell you that? In short, after a couple of hours, I got so cold that I ran to the local McDonald's to warm up. Let me tell you, I had absolutely no other choice. As an excuse, I can give footage of the prices for sweets and chocolate in an ordinary patisserie in the city center. With 4 francs. For one. For one candy. 16 francs for a hundred of grams. 
That's damned 170 euros for a kilo of chocolate. There are no words for that. And incredibly, there were shoppers. Locals come in, pick out some nice candy, buy some. After drooling over these gastronomic specialties, I ran straight from the store to one of the funnest streets in the old town in disgrace. To Augustinergasse. Those German names. Tired of saying them, my godness. This is the second most popular street, which is interesting primarily because of the unprecedented number of flags. Here are the flags of all 26 cantons. And all perpendicular streets are lined with Swiss flags or the flags of Zurich. Or both. St. Peter's Church, the city's oldest church, peeks out from behind the houses and boasts the largest clock face in Europe, nearly 9 meters in diameter. It used to be the reference clock for the whole city. In general, Zurich has the highest concentration of flags in the whole of Switzerland. They're everywhere here as colorful and incomprehensible as possible, but evoking a smile. Zurich is an incredibly beautiful city, steeped in history. All of these ancient cozy streets, ancient buildings, bridges which offer fascinating views. Just look at Grossmünster and Frau Münster, the monastery and the nunnery located on opposite banks of the river Limat. They used to be in a state of permanent hostility, and the ferry was the only way to get from one to the other. Later, this very Munster bridge was built, finally bending together the historic center of the city. Life in Zurich is not as quiet and relaxed as in other Swiss cities. Here, for the first time in my entire trip, I heard drivers honking at each other. Probably in a hurry or even late for something. There might even be occasional crimes and traffic jams, although I wouldn't bet on that. The nature is still gorgeous, and you can go to the waterfront at any time of the day or night. Admire the swans, look at the mountains, and think about how disgusting the weather is here at times. Thanks for watching and bye bye.